Hello and welcome. Moss Adams is pleased that you joined us for today's session, Single Audit Overview, Common Findings and Pitfalls. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our group CPE attendance sheet available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I would like to introduce today's presenters, Matt Dinsdale, Art No, and Sheila Herrera, all seniors here at Moss Adams. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console if you would like more information. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Matt to get the presentation started. Thanks, Danielle. So just a quick agenda. Uh, the topics for today, we're first going to go over a quick single audit overview. Uh, much, many of you uh, attending today might be uh, being introduced to this topic for the first time. You might be uh, undergoing your single audit for the first time this year. So we're going to do a quick introduction on what a single audit is. Then we're going to talk about what to expect when, with your first single audit. So as you're preparing uh, for your first single audit uh, or your compl first compliance audit generally, uh, what can you do to prepare for it? Uh, what can you expect going into it? Uh, what is the audit process? Then we're going to go do a quick overview of, of new uh, grant fundings. Uh, so because uh, of these new funding opportunities available, uh, there are many first timers here. So we're going to talk about uh, some of those some of those opportunities. Then we'll move on to common findings uh, we've seen. Uh, you know, we have a we do a, a, a large volume of compliance audits, we see a lot of uh, federal grants, and so we see some common strains there, and so we want to be able to present to you some of those common findings to help you kind of uh, prevent uh, having to go through that process. And then lastly, we'll talk about some common pitfalls uh, that we see during, the, during the, our single audits. A few words of caution. So the nature of, of compliance and uh, grant funding is that it's constantly changing, even more so in recent years uh, with pandemic era funding. We're seeing a lot of changes very quickly. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, rules can be up in the air. So it's very important that you understand that this is information as of this date, current as of this date, and, and there may be changes tomorrow. Uh, so a reminder to kind of make sure you're up to date on those uh, rules and regulations around grants that you have and you think may be audited. Uh, in regards to deadlines, there, there is a general nine-month deadline for uh, single audits, compliance audits, federal compliance audits. Uh, generally, the federal government does not issue extensions on a, on a person 
or an individual individual basis. Uh, there have been broad uh, extensions in the past, but uh, generally uh, you want to make sure you're aware of those deadlines. You may have earlier deadlines uh, put in place by uh, other organizations or past due entities. So uh, just make sure you're aware of what those deadlines are. Uh, communication, uh, develop a mechanism to stay current with uh, rules and regulations around grants. A lot of federal agencies put out FAQs. Uh, they also put out information uh, through other organizations like the AICPA. Uh, so just be aware that uh, there are resources out there to help you stay up to date and, and create a mechanism to check that on a regular basis. Maybe be part of a mailing list um, with a professional organization that, to keep you up to date on those items. Uh, last is documentation. Uh, as, as auditors, uh, your auditors will have to rely on the documentation you have. And so it's, it's important, a lot of this presentation is going to be uh, stressing the importance of documenting your thought process, documenting uh, supporting evidence uh, around compliance, spending, eligibility, things like that, to make sure you can support uh, your assertion that you are in compliance uh, during an audit. All right, Danielle, looks like we have a poll question. Thank you, Matt. Our first poll question is, what entity type do you represent? A, government, B, nonprofit, C, for-profit commercial organization, D, individual? I'll give you a few moments to respond. To respond, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. You can't see the button, please enlarge the slide area. And we will give you all a few more seconds to get your responses in. And here are the results. All right, looks like most of you are from governments uh, and, and nonprofits, so that's Historically, the majority of grant uh, funding recipients are going to be governments and nonprofits. Uh, with pandemic era funding opportunities that are out there, we're seeing more and more for profits that are uh, receiving funding and having to undergo our compliance audit. So uh, that's, that's good to see that many for profits and individuals are, are here to learn uh, how to go through that type of audit. So now uh, I'll pass it off to Sheila. She's going to talk a little bit about a uh, single audit overview. Thank you, Matt. So I'm going to start with some basic information here about what a single audit is. Uh, to start, it's an organization-wide financial statement and federal awards audit. The single audit is intended um, to be a tool for the granting agencies to make sure that your organization is spending federal dollars appropriately, and the audit becomes sort of a report card back to them to verify that you are in compliance with those rules and regulations that Matt mentioned. Um, they're also making sure that, you know, you've implemented the proper controls to make sure that you are meeting those compliance requirements. And so here on the next slide, um, these are some sources of regulation and interpretation guidance for you. Um, if you do have some of the new funding, you'll want to be very familiar with the last three items on here. Most of the A133 at this point, I think has been phased out. Um, there are a few probably grantors that have some of the old grant dollars that it may still apply, but for the most part, uniform guidance has really taken over here. Um, some of the federal types of programs or federal awards here are listed. Um, this does not encompass everything, but these are some of the ones that may be familiar to many of you that you see in your governments, in your non for profits um, We see a lot of these pop up as major funds as we perform some of these single audits. And you're probably wondering, okay, I did receive um, federal dollars this year. I have this award money. Um, do I have to do a single audit? So the threshold for having to do a single audit is 750,000 
of expenditures. So it's not based on when the funding is necessarily received. If you've received some grant dollars, um, it's gonna be based off when the funding is spent. And so that's important to understand um, how, how that money is being um, spent in any fiscal year that you have. So the first step in determining what your federal expenditures are is to prepare or create the CEPA, which is your schedule of expenditures of federal awards. Um, this is something that management should be preparing um, maybe quarterly um, or if you're doing it once a year, really making sure that you know what all of your programs are that need to go into the CEPA. Um, you want to make sure that the information that you have on the CEPA matches your financial statement system, your records, your financials. Um, the underlying detail is important as we move further along in the audit. Um, the auditor then uses um, that CEFA to perform what we call our planning and risk assessment. We go through and determine which programs need to be audited in the current year. So not, not every program necessarily on your CEFA may, may get selected. Um, sometimes it's based off dollar amounts, um, whether your program has been audited in the past, if um, the OMB has identified it as a higher risk program, that might be some of the criteria. So there are some things that go into the risk assessment to determine which major programs the auditor is gonna be auditing in the current year. It is important to make sure that your CEPA is complete and as accurate as possible. Um, it helps to avoid having to go back and potentially re-audit something or pull additional samples. Um, it avoids having additional major programs. Um, sometimes the accruals, if there are some moving numbers, that tends to be why the CEFA may have changed. And so just really understanding that this is a final CEFA, there's no potential issues, or if there is something that isn't reconciled, um, you wanna make sure that your auditor is aware of that early. And so we do issue an opinion, and we'll go through that in a minute, which opinions we do issue, but we are issuing an in relation to opinion on to whether that CEFA is fairly stated in relation to the financial statements as a whole. And then the auditor, you know, is responsible for making sure that you have um, all the required elements in your CEFA. So the uniform guidance, which is to CFR 200, that lays out exactly the required elements that should be in your CEPA. So if there is any questions, there's lots of guides kind of out there as well to help you. From the auditor reports, um, we do provide several opinions here. We are providing an opinion on the financial statements themselves. We are providing an opinion on the CEPA. We're providing an opinion on compliance with the major federal programs that are being audited. From the auditor report perspective, um, we also have the controls over financial reporting and the controls over compliance, uh, where we're not necessarily providing an opinion on these, but we are, as part of the audit process, performing some level of verifying that there are controls in place. Um, there is a corrective action plan um, that would be included in the financial statements if you do have a finding, for example, and so that does not necessarily have an opinion. And then the response to the findings, uh, management's response would not have an opinion. As part of what we look at from a compliance perspective, um, there are, this is an example of an R&D specific program. As you can see, there's many items that the auditor may need to test. Um, some of them we may not have to, depending on um, the level of, for example, um, activity within your program. And so if you have a program where um, you don't maybe pass through any funds to another grantor or a recipient, um, then we would, wouldn't be looking at something like subrecipient monitoring. Or if you have a program where equipment might be identified here, but you really haven't used the 
the funding to purchase any equipment, then again, we wouldn't look at equipment. It really depends how your program is being operated. And so as part of the audit process, we do go through here and kind of determine what is considered direct and material to your program. And so there's a, a gaining of, of understanding from the auditor perspective to be able to make that assessment. And so from cost characteristics, we do look to make sure um, what is considered allowable, allocable, and reasonable. Matt will go through in a few minutes what some of these mean and from the expectation perspective, what this might look like for you all. And so with that, I will turn it over to Matt with what to expect with your first single audit. All right, we're gonna start with a poll question, uh, Danielle, if you wanna take us through that. Absolutely, so here's poll question number two. Has your organization previously been through any of the following audits? A, financial statement audit. B, single audit, includes financial statement audit. C, program specific audit. D, review engagement. E, never been audited or reviewed. If you're having difficulty seeing the po polls, please use the widgets at the bottom of the screen to open up the slides widget. This is where you will be able to view the poll questions. If you're still having issues, you can also hit F5 to refresh your screen. And as a reminder, if you'd like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. A few more seconds here and we will push through to the results. Here's the results. Thanks, Daniel. So it looks like most uh, most of you have been through a single audit or a financial statement audit, some through a program-specific audit. Uh, so, you know, we don't talk a lot about a program-specific audit, but it is very similar to a single audit in that we are testing compliance and controls over compliance. Uh, it is generally uh, applies to organizations and for-profits that have a single program uh, and not multiple programs. So. That may be, may be an option for you if you have, uh, say, one single program that, that uh, is federal. Um, and I'll just say a lot of these concepts apply to the uh, preparation for a program specific audit as well. All right, so now we're going to quickly go through uh, what the audit process looks like for a single audit or a program audit. Uh, it is very similar to. Uh, the process you'd see in a financial statement audit with some uh, items that are different, some items uh, that you're maybe not used to seeing. So, uh, of course, the, the start of it is you're, you're engaging your auditor to do the work. Uh, the, the second box there, identify client staff improvement. Uh, that, that involvement, sorry, that's, that's a very important one to, to think about at the start because if you have uh, multiple grants that uh, run by multiple departments, you may not think about it, but you might need to include folks from multiple operational departments. Uh, so for example, if you're a university, you may have a sponsored program department that may have programs being audited and they should be aware that their grants will be included and there will be requests and questions coming their way. Uh, so it's important to identify kind of the, the universe of individuals within your organization that may need to be in the know uh, that a single audit is happening, that their program's been selected, uh, and that time will be needed on their side. Uh, next, the preliminary CIFA. Uh, Sheila talked about that already, so I won't go into a lot of detail about that, but preparing a, a preliminary CIFA is important at the start of the audit, and I recommend that you project, uh, if you're providing one that is maybe part of the way through, so maybe nine months through the year, you'll want to project it to the full year because the final determination of what programs to audit is based on the final figures. Uh, so consideration of that final stub period is, is, is important for the auditors to understand what the final numbers will likely look like. After we get that preliminary CIFA, your auditor's going to, going to go through the major program determination, uh, which is formulaic. Uh, Sheila touched on it, so I won't talk a lot about it, but it's based on a formula, based on risk and, and other areas. So uh, after that's determined, we do a risk assessment of those individual programs. Uh, the auditors will likely be interviewing you. Uh, whoever is the kind of owner of that grant will 
likely be interviewed during that process to understand what risks might be involved in that grant. Uh, we also look at inherent risks. Um, is this a new grant to the organization? Uh, is the, has the grant had findings in the past? Has the federal government identified it as a more risky program? So uh, there's a lot of uh, inputs into that ass assessment. And then we'll go through the direct and material compliance requirements. Sheila talked about this again. So we'll identify those areas of the program we need to test. Uh, we are required to do internal control testing and internal control walkthroughs. So that means we have to walk through those controls, who's signing off on the invoice, who's evaluating uh, eligibility for a program, and, and seeing what those controls are and documenting the processes. Then we go through the process, kind of the meat of the work is, is really testing controls uh, and compliance. So typically this is on a transactional basis or an individual by individual basis. So uh, it, it can take anywhere from a few days to a week or longer, depending on, on the type of program you have, the, the, the size of the program. Uh, so you'll want to make sure you understand what areas are being tested by your auditor uh, and, and how many selections you think there will be, uh, because you may need to make a lot more time for that uh, than you may, may think. And after testing is completed, your auditor will typically conclude on compliance uh, to, to determine whether, number one, uh, can, can they render an opinion, a clean opinion on compliance? But also, are there any other findings that may need to be reported? Uh, typically, your auditor is going to walk through those with you as things come up, right? If they're looking at something and there's no, no uh, sign off, no uh, uh, approval of a cost, or maybe a cost that doesn't look like it's allowable under the terms of the grant. That will typically be brought up during the process and you'll have time to investigate. Maybe you just need more information. Um, but once all the information is gathered and everything's been concluded on, findings may be involved. It's not the end of the world. Uh, the government typically is, is more concerned about the severity of the finding uh, and, and how the organization or the government or the uh, company is responding to the finding and resolving it, especially if there's multiple years of audits the resolution of those findings moving on uh, is, is very important. Then reporting, uh, we issue a few different reports that Sheila went over, uh, as, as well as the findings. We kind of call it the report card with our clients because it really kind of, there's a, there's a summary schedule that lays out, you know, are there any findings? Uh, what's the opinion? Uh, is it a high risk audit, is it a low risk audit? So uh, the reporting is issued, and then finally the data collection form. This is an important, uh, important step not to forget. The data collection form is, the, is how, the, how the audit is submitted to the federal government. And it includes all the data that was included as part of the reporting package. You have typically 30 days after the audit is issued to send that in. And if you do not send it in with the 30 days, the next year's audit is considered a uh, a higher risk, um, you're considered a higher risk auditee. And what that means is you may, we may need to, the auditor may need to test more, more programs. So there is a direct correlation between the severity of, uh, of next year's work and the timeliness of, of submitting that data collection form. So important to get that in. All right, so how can you prepare? Uh, Evaluating the kind of populations, we call them in the universe of your, of your costs is, is important. So look at your costs uh, that will be subject to auditing and look at, review them, see, you know, did, did we capture everything? Is there anything in here that might not be allowable uh, or might have been accidentally coded to the wrong grant? Uh, a, a thorough review is, is, is a good idea, uh, especially if you don't have a high volume of costs. Um, look at the large ones, look at the small ones. Uh, look at credits in the population. Try to pick out things that are outliers and make sure that they're supposed to be there. It's important to tie back, be able to tie back those populations to your CIFA and your reporting. Your auditors will look at that and, and, and be uh, considering how those uh, amounts tie into the populations which tie into other external documents like reporting in the CIFA. We talked about expenses, so we'll move on to the last bullet point is uh, a thorough view before bringing in, in uh, to your auditor. So uh, not only you want to look at those populations, but if you have other populations, like if you have, maybe you're giving uh, grants to, to children or providing uh, uh, education 
or other things that might be kind of non-monetary, eligibility might be a factor in there. And so making sure you have all the folks that receive services and, and um, there's supporting documents for all those people and, and approvals and things like that, that that may need to be in place is, is, is important. All right, so uh, we picked out a couple of areas of testing here. I think it's important to, to kind of uh, press upon everyone. So uh, expenses must be documented, including third-party documentation if applicable. So an example of this is, uh, you know, if you're maybe you had to buy something off of Amazon, right? And so you have a credit card charge going to Amazon. Uh, it's a that is not alone. That alone is not a good documented expense because you can buy anything from Amazon, right? So it's important to make sure you have evidence of what was purchased, when it was purchased, who it was purchased from, uh, how it was paid. All that information will be gathered as part of the audits. Uh, documenting controls over uh, signature and uh, or through signature or other electronic means. You don't necessarily have to have someone signing off on them. that. That's uh, not every, a lot of folks use uh, uh, evidence based in uh, electronic means. So an email or some sort of procurement software that documents those approvals. Uh, just make sure that you have that ready so the auditor is gonna ask for it and wanna look at those approvals. Uh, you can also look at controls uh, in, in, on a summarized basis as well. So maybe you have a review of a budget to actual that a program officer does uh, on a monthly basis or weekly basis. If that is documented, that's done, that may be a good control to say, hey, look, we look at all the costs that were incurred over this week or this month and they all appear consistent with my expectations, they're all approved, uh, that, that's a good control as well. So it doesn't necessarily need to be on a, a transactional by transaction basis. Procurement and subrecipient monitoring, these are areas where a lot of due diligence is required. The federal government, for example, in procurement requires you to look at uh, the cost and if it's over a certain threshold, you may need to get quotes, you may need to do bidding. So documentation of those processes is important. Uh, also, with subrecipient monitoring, if you're uh, sub, you're providing funds to another organization to do part of a program, uh, you may need to monitor them. So, doing a risk assessment of that of that individual organization, looking at their audit reports, things like that, those should all be documented um, because the auditors will likely need to be uh, looking at those types of things. All right, the different types of audit evidence that uh, auditors will gather. So the first thing is they'll be vouching. I already mentioned you want to have not only the invoice, external third-party invoice, as well as uh, uh, payment support to, to show that you actually paid for those costs. Uh, but you'll also want to be able to, you know, if you have equipment that's being used, maybe the auditors might want to inspect that. So it's important to have that readily available for inspection. Uh, You'll also maybe need to document in a memo something. So, for example, if there's a complex transaction that's being re, uh, reimbursed uh, or, or some sort of complex uh, consideration of, of allowability, you may want to document it in a memo and have it uh, reviewed by someone and, and, and signed off and, and evidence there. That way, uh, that provides a good context for the auditor to understand the reason for a purchase or uh, a certain action. Uh, Art's going to go into more detail on controls, but uh, there's different ways to document those controls. I already mentioned a signature, emails, uh, memos. Uh, it's important to consider whether you have a control or a process. Auditor needs to re rely on controls, not processes. Um, and Art will go into more detail on that. Some other concepts you'll hear thrown around during an audit: uh, population or universe. You can use either either word is is pretty commonly used. Uh, but having a, a full, complete a uh, list of all the costs reimbursed or all the individuals or services were, services were provided to them or grants were provided to them uh, is important. Uh, auditors are very concerned with completeness and making sure that those populations are complete uh, as well as accurate. Uh, sampling, so most auditors will use sampling uh, as well as some direct testing, but sampling involves you know randomly looking at things uh, to make sure we can get a good idea of what a random sample is, uh, you, you need to consider multiple things like the size of the population. How big is it? If it's a larger population, the sample size will probably be larger. If it's a riskier population, uh, 
more more inherent risk, uh, more things potentially could go wrong. It might be a larger population. Uh, there's other areas that, that may go into that, um, like, for example, control reliance. So during a single audit, you're required to test controls. It's a little different from a financial audit. If you've undergone a financial audit, you may know that your auditor may have the option to test internal controls, but not required to. With a single audit, you're required to. The auditor is required to test internal controls. So the amount of controls in place and how well they're operating may impact the size of uh, size of the population. So there's a lot of good controls that may be a smaller, smaller sample size. Now we're going to talk uh, a little bit about some of the new grant funding opportunities that are out there you, that you'll likely um, see a lot of, uh, your auditors will likely see a lot of this year. So SVOG grant, uh, this was provided to uh, governments, nonprofits, for-profits, uh, essentially, it was provided to different uh, venue operators, uh, you know, live entertainment, bands, things like that, uh, as well as, you know, performers, performing artists, uh, uh, others that, that kind of uh, rely on that industry, work in that industry, uh, to make sure that it stayed open during the pandemic period. Because as you, as you remember, uh, there's a long period of time where comedy shows, uh, uh, venues were shut down. Uh, indefinitely, right, until things kind of eased up a bit. And so the government said, we don't want all these companies going out of business. Uh, a lot of nonprofits run uh, different you know, symphonies and things like that to go out of business. So they gave this, gave this money out to uh, cover the costs of, of, of basically just operating. So the nature of the program is it, it, a lot of different costs are allowable, and it goes all the way back to the start of the pandemic. Uh, so this is kind of a unique program. Uh, it's, it's an inter interesting one, uh, and you may you may have some of this, uh, and it's important to kind of understand some of the unique aspects of this grant. So research research and development is not a new one. Uh, this is one of the oldest uh, grants out there, but uh, it, there's a it's a little more prevalent because of the amount of COVID uh, research funding that went out, um, as well as cancer research and other uh, types of research that uh, are being more heavily funded. Uh, this uh, this funding can go out to nonprofits, for profits, uh, and, and it encapsulates a lot of different funding from a lot of different sources. So you can see there, NIH is probably the most commonly seen. Uh, Department of Energy, Department of Defense also provides research funds to organizations and for profits to do research. Um, it's mostly competitive. Uh, a, a quick note on this one: if you receive funding. Uh, from a non-federal entity. So let's say you have a research, you have some research you're doing and you receive it from uh, a university, let's say. Uh, that university is probably not a federal entity, right? But that funding may have been received by the university from a federal source like the NIH. It's, that's still susceptible to, to being included in the audit. So that number still goes on your CIFA and may be selected as part of the audit. Uh, so it's important to recognize you're not only looking for funding that comes directly from the federal government, but also indirectly from the federal government. Uh, this one is, is one that's directly provided to uh, governments. So this provides funding uh, for COVID-19 emergency costs, uh, as well as recovery from the, from the uh, pandemic. Uh, a lot of governments that may not have needed single audits have this funding that puts them above that threshold. And so there is an uh, attestation option provided to uh, those entities where they don't need to go under a full, through a full single audit, they may just need to go through a kind of a lesser scoped audit. Um, so if you do have that funding and you're finding your, yourself kind of newly required to undergo an audit, uh, it's a good idea to make sure you understand that attestation option. Uh, and you may want to take advantage of that. Uh, it may be less burdensome. Uh, for you. Uh, CRF, this is mostly spent out. Uh, a lot of organizations, governments, and, and entities really re received a good amount of coronavirus relief funds. Uh, this was more heavily seen in 2020, 2021, but by now, most of this is phased out. Uh, but if you do have any kind of trailing funds, um, it, it's a very kind of catch-all grant. It's provided uh, to help kind of uh, uh, recover and, and cover costs of, of the pandemic. 
and then provide a relief fund. This, I, I won't go into a lot of detail about this. I'll just remind people that it's very uh, a unique grant and how it presents itself on the CIFA is very complex. So there's different tranches of funding, different reporting periods, and based on those, it may or may not go on different years on the CIFA. So if you do have this funding and a decent amount of that funding, I just recommend you reach out to an auditor, uh, an accounting firm that performs these audits and understands it really well, and they can help guide you through, hey, do we need an audit? Is, is, where does this funding go on the CIFA? What year does it go in? Um, and that would determine whether or not you need an audit. Um, there can be cases where, you know, maybe you don't realize money should go on the CIFA and then you miss the audit deadline uh, and you have to kind of make that up. So, all right, uh, I'm going to switch it over to Art. Uh, he's going to talk about common findings. Thank you, Matt. So it looks like we'll start off with a poll question, Danielle. Absolutely. Polling question number three. What area do you feel the most improvement is needed before proceeding with an audit? A, internal controls. B, documentation. C, staffing to support an audit. Or D, education about the process. You do have the option to submit questions for us in the Q&A window. We have quite a bit of content to cover today, so if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, we'll do our best to follow up with you afterwards. And we'll allow a few more seconds here for your responses. And here are our results. So it looks like it's split um, pretty much evenly across the four uh, do documentation taking the lead. Um, I think this is very, I think I've seen this for all the clients. It's just a, a lot of different issues uh, or areas of improvement, uh, especially with the pandemic uh, staffing to support the audit is an area that we've seen uh, increase over the year uh, just because, you know, with the turnover at, based at all organizations, uh, the staffing to support the audit and compliance, uh, we've seen this. And then uh, education about the process, uh, especially with this new uh, programs that Matt had discussed earlier, uh, just some education about how the single audit process works. A lot of our clients are undergoing the single audit for the very first time. Uh, so a lot of the organizations that we have dealt with um, just need an education process of how the single audit uh, works and you know, what, what controls needs to be in place, uh, best practice recommendations. And then lastly, the, the last two internal controls and documentation always an area of, uh, of improvement uh, for any organization. Usually when you have a compliance finding, you always find that it's related to an internal control breakdown or something went wrong with the internal controls that didn't prevent or detect uh, that compliance matter. Um, on this slide, we'll talk about the elements of a finding if you do have a, a federal compliance finding. I uh, won't spend too much time in all the boxes, but just wanna highlight to you what uh, the elements are. Uh, so the very first one is criteria specific, specific requirement. Uh, this is this comes from either the compliance supplement or the grant agreement. It's just the, the specific requirement that is related to the non-compliance finding or the internal control uh, finding. And then the condition uh, is just stating what happened, uh, what the error is. Uh, question cost, usually there's a, there's a dollar amount related to uh, the findings, so that's just documenting uh, the sample that was selected, uh, the, the costs that are in question, um, just related to the finding. And then context, uh, just how that happened, how the error happened, uh, just documenting, you know, is this a control breakdown or what happened to uh, cause that non-compliance finding? And then effect, uh, documenting the, the compliance finding, the overall impact of the organization's non-compliance finding or the internal control breakdown, what impact it has on the financial statements and the organization's compliance uh, related to that federal program. And then cause, uh, what happened, uh, you know, did controls break down, what caused this error to occur or this finding to uh, be reported are included with the financial reporting package. 
And the recommendation, uh, this comes from the auditors, it's just uh, the auditors uh, make a recommendation of best practice or how to uh, uh, implement controls going forward to prevent or detect uh, the error from, from uh, not occurring in the future. So it's just a recommendation of, you know, inter 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 controls of how to prevent this going forward. And then lastly, the views of responsible officials and corrective action plan. Uh, these are, um, these are, uh, these should be similar in matter, but not, if not the same, uh, usually the responsible, the views of a responsible official will document uh, that they agree with the finding and also document uh, what corrective action plans are going to be put in place uh, to correct this error going forward. Uh, just as a note, the auditors are required to follow up uh, with any prior year findings and report on the status of whether or not the finding was corrected. Uh, so something to uh, keep in mind that if you do have a federal finding, the auditors will take a look at that uh, in the next year to make sure that the corrective action plan was properly put in place and that the that it was remedied. Um, so on this next slide, we'll go over some of the common findings. Uh, these are the different uh, compliance attributes that are listed in the, in the federal compliance supplement uh, that's issued by the OMB. Um, uh, so these are the different elements that the auditors will look at, uh, not necessarily for all federal programs, but in the compliance supplement, uh, in the part two of that compliance supplement I'll list out the applicable areas for each uh, federal program that is being audited. Um, so I won't go over uh, the common findings for all these letters, but just go over some of the highlighted ones. Uh, the very first one is allowable cost and cost principles. Uh, this is probably an area where we see a lot of the, the findings. Either uh, there's not enough documentation to show that the transaction was reviewed or approved, uh, so a control finding, or uh, we would also see uh, that the organization uh, used the funds uh, for a for a purpose that wasn't an allowable cost. Uh, so organizations should understand or should read through uh, the compliance supplement or the grant agreement to understand what the, those allowable costs are and ensure that controls are in place to uh, monitor or approve transactions that are consistent with that grant document or the compliance supplement. The next one is related to cash management. Um, there's there's a lot of different methods in which an organization can receive uh, federal funds uh, reimbursement method. There's the cash advance method, uh, just in time. Uh, understanding uh, how the organization receives uh, federal funds will help the organization set up proper controls to address uh, this compliance area. Uh, the most common finding that we see in this area is that the, that the organization uh, the time uh, between uh, cash drawdown and when the funds are dispersed. Uh, there are specific requirements of when or how much time they can hold on to the money. Uh, the most common finding is just the organization not dispersing the funds in time. Um, also another common finding is the interest income calculation. Organizations are required to uh, calculate interest earned on federal funds. Uh, some organizations don't have the proper controls in place, so that's another finding that will typically see for cash management. And then for matching level effort and earmarking, uh, matching requirement requires organizations to match or spend a, spe a specified dollar amount of non-federal dollars as it relates to uh, federal expenditures for that program. Not all programs have matching requirements there, but there are some programs out there with matching requirements. Uh, level of effort, uh, there's two different components with level of effort. Uh, supplant uh, versus not supplant, not supplement, and then maintenance of effort. And then earmarking, uh, it instructs uh, organizations how to spend federal dollars. Uh, the most common finding that we see with this compliance attribute is that either matching level effort or earmarking are not met uh, due to lack of controls. Um, if, this era, if this attribute is applicable, uh, some of the best practices include uh, matching uh, for matching, uh, matching every transaction with non-federal dollars. So when you do have that that expenditure, uh, make sure that you match it with non-federal funds as well, so that you can keep up with the with the matching requirements. Uh, for level effort earmarking, ensuring controls are in place uh, 
around the budgeting process to address the level of effort and earmarking requirements, and then designing controls to monitor uh, compliance with that uh, throughout the year. So uh, looking at uh, quarterly reports or annual reports to make sure that the organization is in, in compliance with either level of effort, earmarking, or matching. Uh, for procurement, suspension, debarment, uh, Later on, we'll, we'll, we'll cover this in a little bit more detail, but this deals with the bear claw uh, with the different dollar amounts and thresholds. Uh, there, there are different requirements of, you know, when to, uh, uh, when to collect uh, competitive bids or when to maintain documentation with, a, with the approval of the different bids. Uh, so we'll cover this in a little bit more detail, but a lot of, this, a lot of the findings that we'll see is that uh, lack of documentation related to uh, different purchases. And for reporting, uh, the most the, the most common finding for this one is just the timeliness of uh, report submission, either to uh, the or the sub or the from the sub recipient to the recipient organization or to the federal grantor, um, and, or uh, the report review. So making sure that there's proper controls in place uh, to review and approve that that report that's being submitted. And then lastly, uh, for subrecipient monitoring, this only applies to uh, recipients who have subrecipients. Uh, we'll go over the controls in the later slide, but uh, the common finding that we see for this one is just the lack of control of monitoring uh, the subrecipient transactions. Uh, on this next slide, uh, just some common findings related to uh, internal controls for the CEFA, uh, making sure that you properly uh, reflect all federal grants in the CEFA. Uh, a lot of the organizations that we, we've audited uh, don't have uh, controls in place to identify or tr separately track uh, federal dollars coming in and federal expenditures. Uh, so it's very important that your organization have uh, controls in place to identify what those federal expenditures are so that you have a complete uh, CFO listing out all the federal programs and then the federal expenditures related to it. Um, so also with this too, it's important to have controls in place to have someone review and approve uh, that CFO as well, uh, having that segregation of duties uh, so that you don't uh, perform a self-review of that CFO that's prepared. And then lastly, uh, with the COVID-19 uh, funding, uh, there are some additional requirements as it relates to SEPA. Um, if it is a COVID-19 program, uh, you are required to have that COVID-19 as a prefix, and then that program needs to be broken out as a separate line item in the SEPA. Uh, next, we'll cover some common pitfalls. So some best practices uh, as it relates to uh, controls and federal compliance, uh, making sure that documentation is there, uh, audit, audit trails there. So as auditors, when we look at uh, federal compliance and internal controls, uh, we look for the approval or the review of transactions. So if that's not formally documented, there's no way for the auditors to uh, determine whether or not that control is in place and operating uh, effectively. So making sure that, you know, when you do have that control uh, design, that you make sure that the person who's reviewing or approving is documenting uh, their review and the date the review is performed. Other best practices, uh, train staff involved in federal grants, making sure that they are aware of the compliance requirements and then making sure they understand what uh, best practices are for maintaining a strong uh, control environment. Uh, it's very important for them to understand you know, you know what, what they're looking at when they are approving transactions, how that impacts compliance. So it's very important for them to understand uh, the, the different compliance requirements for that specific program. Uh, for the CEPA, some of the best practices we mentioned earlier, uh, making sure that it's reviewed and approved, uh, making sure if you have a COVID-19 program that you label it COVID-19 and that it's broken out as a separate line item in the CEPA. Uh, the last two bullet points in the very first column, controls and processes, we'll cover this in the next slide, but uh, 
uh, just understanding what the differences are between uh, a control or a, or a process is very important. Uh, controls is what the auditors look at. We'll make sure that uh, that it's being reviewed and approved and that's formally documented. Uh, we, we look at controls uh, to either uh, risk assess or reduce the amount of testing that we need to perform for the single audit. So it's very important to have those controls uh, formally documented. Uh, on the bright slide, interacting with your auditor, that's very important, especially if you have a new federal program. Uh, just reaching out to your auditor, understanding what some of the best practices are. Uh, as auditors, we deal with a lot of these different programs for various clients. So it's always good to get the feedback from your auditor to uh, understand, you know, are there any best practices out there that you should consider as you're designing those controls. Uh, audit scheduling and planning, uh, just the timing of that, making sure that you allow enough time for the auditors to audit that program. And then if they do identify any deficiencies or any uh, compliance matters, that there's enough time to respond to it. So you don't want to try to schedule this, you know, at the tail end of the audit where they're completing it, but you're not, you don't have enough time to uh, respond to the, the question costs or the compliance findings. On this next slide, we talk about uh, process and versus controls. Uh, understanding the difference between a process uh, versus control is very important to address risk and help your organization reduce uh, the risk of non-compliance. Uh, for a process, it's an action meant to process or record something. Uh, the examples that we provide are, uh, first, all vendor invoices are sent to the program manager for review and approval. Uh, this is just a process because the invoices are just being sent to the manager for review and approval. Uh, the other example is invoices are sent to accounts table uh, to be recorded in GL. So these are just processes. On the very on the very right side, an action. Remember, an action is to uh, prevent or detect an error or a misstatement or, or uh, non-compliance. Uh, so the example that we provide is the program manager reviews. The invoice uh, by verifying vendor services were performed. Uh, services are an allowable cost and that it can be paid from the program funds. And then lastly, very important is that the approval is documented by initials on the invoice. Uh, remember, uh, as auditors, we are looking for that approval uh, to support that that control is in place and that that, that control is actually occurring. So without doc that documentation, the auditor uh, would not be able to verify that that control is actually occurring. So it's, it's really important to make sure that documentation is there. On this slide, we provide some examples of controls uh, versus process. Uh, so on the left-hand side, uh, a review with a sign-off uh, is a control. There's someone that's formally reviewing uh, the transaction and then evidencing it with a sign-off. Uh, performing a reconciliation with initials, so either bank reconciliation or a reconciliation of some report, uh, making sure that's properly uh, signed off with the initial and the date that it was performed. Uh, tagging of assets, uh, signature and risk assessment, uh, approval of purchase orders. So a lot of these are review and approval process or re review and approval procedures, uh, along with uh, formal documentation of it. So those are the control. Uh, items and then for process uh, just performing the reconciliation posting journal entries uh, entering information uh, providing a budget uh, to actual report uh, physical count of equipment those are just processes on this next slide we'll cover some uh, best practices as it relates to internal controls. Uh, the very first one is related to uh, written policies and procedures, uh, ensuring that you have formal documentation of policies and procedures in place. Uh, this could be related to procurement. There's that bear clause uh, for the procurement requirement. Uh, very important to have the procurement policy uh, doc formally documented. Um, and then also with any grant management, record retention, having those policies and procedures uh, formally documented as well. Uh, also very important to have 
uh, written standards of conduct uh, documented. So anything with uh, conflicts of interest, uh, code, code of conduct, or ethical policies, uh, making sure that you have documentation around those policies and procedures. Uh, the third box down, uh, risk-based due, dil due diligence. Um, examples includes enhanced eligibility review of subrecipients with imperfect uh, performance history. Uh, so that is an example of uh, risk-based due diligence into our controls. And then uh, make sure that if you have subrecipients that you do uh, pre-award uh, risk assessments. I believe Matt covered this earlier, uh, going on SAM.gov, making sure that they are not a vendor or uh, an organization that's listed as a suspended or debarred organization. So uh, performing those risk assessment procedures, uh, looking at that SAM.gov website or reviewing prior year audit report uh, to make sure that there's no uh, material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that would set off alarms. A few more items, uh, record maintenance and retention uh, make sure that you ha that you maintain uh, documentation for the review and approval of subrecipient payment information uh, for procure procurement procurement suspension debarment. Making sure that that is formally documented. If you have any bids or any formal approval of contracts, uh, make sure that's formally documented, and approved. And then uh, for suspension and debarment, when you uh, perform that um, review of SAM.gov making sure that's formally documented either on the contract or some documents showing that you perform that review. Um, single audit uh, reporting, uh, some of the things to consider to uh, as you're going through in single audit. So look at the uniform guidance for any changes. Uh, the uniform guidance is constantly changing every year. Uh, so making sure that you look at that um, to ensure that you understand if there are any changes to reflect it in your policies and procedures. Uh, COVID-19, if you have any Art? programs. Uh... No, sorry, let me interrupt you really quick. I think we need to do the last poll before it gets too late. Um, okay. So, Danielle, do you want to do the last poll and we'll switch back? Yes, absolutely. All right, our last poll question is, after attending this webcast, do you feel you are ready for an audit? A, yes, B, no. C, almost there, I will be ready by our scheduled audit. Or D, I'm not sure and will likely need more help to get ready. For those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handout. We will also be sending the slides via email tomorrow along with the recording of the webcast. I'm just gonna leave this up for a few more moments. So everybody get your responses in. We will take a quick review of our results. So it looks like maybe you're prepared for not it or you're almost there. Uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to anyone that has presented today and we'll be, we'll be happy to assist you with any questions you may have. Um, so I just wanna dive into, I have about two minutes. I'm just diving to the last two slides real quick. Um, Uh, for the procurement clause, for the, for the procurement claw, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this. There, there are some changes to this. In August of 2020, uh, the threshold for micro purchases and the simplified acquisition thresholds were increased uh, for the micro purchases. It went from 3,500 to now to 10,000, and then for the simplified uh, acquisition thresholds from 150,000 to 250,000 dollars. So, just a change of threshold that you should be aware of there. Um, for suspension debarment, uh, some things to consider. Uh, let's perform at least one of the following uh, check systems for award management. So SAM.gov uh, to make sure that the vendor or subrecipient is listed as a suspended debarred organization. Uh, collect certification of non-suspension debarment from vendor subrecipient, making sure that document and maintained. And then adding a clause or condition to the covered transaction with the vendor or subrecipient. So it looks like we are out of time.
All right. Well, thank you, Matt, Art, and Sheila, for a great presentation today. I also want to thank the audience for being engaged and submitting your questions to help guide today's conversation. If we didn't have time to answer yours, we'll do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. Also, feel free to reach out to our presenters if you have additional questions. And just as a reminder, you will be receiving today's slides, so the ones that we weren't able to get to, uh, keep an eye out for those as they come. Jump ahead here. If you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. A copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console. And finally, here's a link to an online survey for today's presentation. Thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time. Take care, everyone.